some years ago, I had a, a, a knock on a knock on my door, and um, uh, a man called Per Lindstrand, a, a Swedish man, came and saw me, and he said, um, uh, "You know, Richard, you you love a challenge. Um, the highest a balloon has ever been is um, eight thousand feet, and." The furthest a balloon has ever been is uh, 600 feet. Uh, sorry, 600 miles. And um, I think I can build a balloon that can go up to 35,000 feet, um, and that has the possibility of crossing the, crossing the Atlantic. Um, and uh, you know, I was initially quite skeptical, but I you know, checked out that he had a family and he had children, and uh, and um, uh, and uh, and always find in life it's more fun to say yes than to say no. So, uh, so I said, well, you know, let's give it a go. Um, and um, I went off to Spain to uh, get my ballooning license. Uh, you know, the, at the end of the week had my ballooning license. Uh, a week later found myself in Sugarloaf Mountain in, in America, uh, ready to take off to fly the largest balloon ever built um, uh, to see whether uh, the, it would withstand 140 miles an hour of winds in the jet stream uh, to cross the Atlantic. Um, anyway, we, we had a great adventure. Um, uh, somehow or another, Perlinstrand uh, left the balloon uh, during, the, <laughs> during the crossing, uh, which meant I ended up having to fly the largest balloon ever built on my own. And uh, I'd only had about you know, th three, hours, three or four hours lessons, um, and, that, and that was an interesting situation. Um, <laughs> And, um, and this was the first of six times that I'd been pulled out of the sea uh, fly in, in, in by helicopters uh, when trying to break uh, global ballooning records. We went, we went from the Atlantic to the Pacific to tri many, many trips where we tried to go around the world. Great adventures, great fun. Um, and by the way, a balloon can fly in the jet stream. I mean, the, the, the fastest we ever got was uh, 260 miles an hour crossing the Pacific in the jet stream. Um, and uh, the highest we ever went, where we went meant to go that high, was 44,000 feet to put out a far on top of the to, on top of the balloon. Uh, the, the only way we could put the far out was to go high in order to where, where there's no air. Uh, and um, uh, but you know but the, the balloon was only meant to be pressurised to 38,000 feet, so it was a hair raising as we were going up. Uh, um, uh, foot by foot, um, hoping that the, the, the capsule would, would withstand it. But um, now Jose uh, has uh, an even more remarkable challenge, so um, he's going to take it, take it one step further. So over to Jose. Thank you, Richard. Well, first, I'll, I'd like to thank uh, Eva and Sonu for, for inviting me here and, and, all the, and all the hosts, because it's, it's been an amazing experience. It's, it's a great place. Yeah, well, um, imagine flying on a balloon high enough that the sky becomes completely black and the sun becomes even brighter and, and white and the line of the horizon bends, bends, bends and becomes a perfect curve and the, the earth is now blue so you're above the blue of the sky and the blue is below you um, you can press play this is a video from one of our test flights to illustrate what I just described we've flown test vehicles to 33 kilometers altitude. That's the sun, that's what I was describing. You see the whole of Spain? Well, there's a, a, an author from, from Harvard called uh, Frank White. He, he wrote a book called The Overview Effect, and he uh, interviewed many, many astronauts and asked them uh, how did they feel before and after their trip. And the remarkable thing and what connects with the theme of this symposium here is that they became much more aware of global problems specifically uh, ecology problems because it's obvious that everything is interconnected when you go up there next slide please i mean we, when you get this sort of view and this sort of perspective and you can reflect a little bit on it um, it's a um, it's a very powerful um, thing for a human being to experience so why am i doing all this next slide um, well the you know, the first people that, that saw the Earth, like I just described, were not uh, the, what most people would answer. I mean, most people would say, oh, well, the first people that saw this were, were flying on rockets, and maybe Yuri Gagarin or Leica the dog, you know? Well, actually, the truth is that people have been seeing this view since the 20s of the last century. 
This is a stamp from the Soviet Union from 1933 of a balloon that, that went and, and, and offered that view. This is a balloon from a French scientist that discovered why Mars is red, flying with his little, hel uh, little telescope. And, and he couldn't find a big balloon, so he hooked up many of them, like in the movie Up, and went, <laughs> went to the edge of space and, and came back. And so it's been done, re I mean, not a lot, but it's been done in the past, and everything stopped in 61, 1961, at this sort of extreme altitude ballooning. But you can imagine with the materials that we have now, we, we, can, we can do it uh, better. So uh, next slide, Wh where am I coming from? Why, why I'm interested in, in this. This next slide. Well, that's me when I was two years old. My, the first time I, I went to Kennedy Space Center. And my father is, um, is a physicist. He studies atmospheres, so studied, studied the atmosphere of the Earth, and many of the worrisome things that are happening to it. And to better understand the Earth, it's quite useful, actually, to look what's going on on other planets and other, on other celestial bodies, uh, like Venus or, or Titan. Which, which could be potential past or potential futures for, for, for us. And so I've been around rockets, uh, telescopes, balloon launch for scientific purposes all, all my life. So I became an engineer, aerospace engineer, and went to, to school and went for the work for the European Space Agency for a company, but I couldn't, for Boeing actually, and I couldn't find an environment where new ideas, really unconventional ideas that were not just uh, Copy paste from from the Cold War uh, could be could be done. So so I started my company. Next, and Orpheus project is a balloon. It's it's a very different. Uh, it's a very strange balloon, but basically it's a it's a large scientific balloon that carries a, a pressurized pod to 36 kilometers and stays there for two hours and comes back on parachutes. Why coming back on parachute and not with a balloon? Because it's, uh, we think it's, it's safer. That's how the early American uh, space program came back from, from up there. That's how the, the Soviet came back from, from extreme altitudes. So that's how um, the Chinese are doing it. And probably the, some future American programs will do that as well. Of course, there's no rocket. There's no high-speed reentry. So we think it's, uh, it's a lot less attractive for uh, high acceleration thrill seekers, but we think uh, it has a, a, another attractive, and that's the fact that it, the whole operation can be easily done with zero emissions. Because there's no engine, it's just using helium, there's just uh, uh, energy storage, which can be uh, electric on board. So you can quite easily offer an experience that very, very few people have had, not only for tourists, but also for scientists. The thing is that we don't put that on our business plan because it depends so much on, on government policy that, that that's something that if it comes, it, it good. And yeah, ne next slide. Uh, you can play the video. This is from a, from a test flight. We haven't been able to fly a human yet, not because I mean, basically because of financial reasons, but we just closed funding to, to fire first human. That's a that's pressurized capsule. It's a toroid. I have a patent on that, on that, on that shape for, for this uh, type of application. And, and that's, that's how, how it'll look like. Uh, next, uh, next slide. Well, that's a, that's a Spanish um, a football jersey uh, shirt, which I'm wearing right now here. And Right, come on in. Yeah. <laughs> and it went up in one of her test flights. We did that between the semi-final and the final of, of the World Cup uh, to honor our, our country. And I, I, I feel really moved when they said that the Réunion or Maldives can be more than just a tourist destination, but can be a, a hub for, for innovation and testing new things. And I feel the same about Spain. Spain can be much more than uh, Benidorm and all these uh, horrible uh, developments. Uh, and, and banking crisis and all that. I mean, in Spain, we, we can be good at football and we can be good at, at sustainability and high-end tourism as well and our space technology. So that's, uh, that's uh, where, I'm, where I'm coming from. And, and I'm, I'd, I'd really like to, to pass it on now to, to Richard to, to see his, his point of view and also um, for him to tell us a little bit more about 
other frontiers of the human experience that his, his company is, is pushing, uh, like, like Virgin Galactic, um, which is going much higher than us, and, or, or Virgin Oceanic. Um, anyway, I think I mean, w yeah, what you're doing is, is magnificent. And um, uh, I mean, this, week, this week, I'm going, going from here to open um, uh, the first commercial spaceport in New Mexico. Um, uh, your, your project, you know, would, I mean, New Mexico would be a perfect place to um, la launch your project. And, um, and I can imagine quite a lot of our astronauts you know, would love to, you know, lo lo love to uh, go, get, uh, you know, love to go up with in one of your balloons. Um, yeah, I mean, Virgin Galactic, um, uh, yeah, is, a, is another dream, um, which um, you know, we first dreamt about in. 1990, we registered the name Virgin Galactic Airways. We thought it sounded good, um, and then we set about looking for engineers and technicians who could uh, build a safe um, uh, spaceship that um, uh, would offer return tickets to space. Um, and um, and I think we're we're very very close to fulfilling that dream. Um, uh, and uh, because um, we launched from 60,000 feet. Um, uh, you know, we, get, we, we take them up in, a, in the mothership. Uh, it's the largest carbon fiber um, plane ever built. Um, and in fact, Boeing and Airbus both, you know, came to look at that plane. I mean, they came before the 787 was built to, you know, get ideas about, you know, c can they get an all, all comp carbon composite commercial plane, which would save a, a lot of fuel. Um, and then the spaceship drops away and goes from, uh, Naught to 3,000 miles an hour in eight seconds, so um, quite a quite a rush, <laughs> slightly different experience, um, and um, and then we you go into space and you become an astronaut and um, and uh, and I suspect you ha have have the ride of ride of a lifetime, and um, anyway that's something which we, we will we will be up and running in about 12 months time, so we're we're all, all, almost there, um, and the other the other very exciting venture we're working on is um, underwater. I mean, is, is seeing whether we can build a submarine that can go and explore the bottoms of the oceans. A, a lot of scientists would love, love to be able to know what's going on down there. They think about 80% of the species on Earth have not been discovered. Um, and if you can have a submarine that can go down uh, 37,000 feet uh, and actually not just go down and touch the bottom and come back up again, go down and explore properly, I think we'll learn you know, we'll learn a lot. So, you know, we're hoping next year to, that that submarine will pass its pressure tests. Uh, the pressure on that submarine will be 1,600 times the pressure that an airplane has to put up with. So massive, massive pressure. Um, and, um, and, you know, obviously you can do it if it's just a sort of solid block of metal, but then you won't be able to see out of it. So uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do it using carbon fiber. and. Uh, using materials so that you can actually get get it um, get, get a, a good view as well, um, and um, if successful, the plan is that to, over the next eighteen months to go to the five deepest um, places in the world, um, and um, I'm going to take it down at the Puerto Rican Trench, which is about five miles from Necker Island in the Caribbean. Um, no, no, nobody's ever been down more than twenty or thirty feet, and. Um, uh, and it goes down 28,000 feet, um, you know, deeper than Everest is high. Um, somebody else, I'm glad to say, is taking it down the Mariana Trench, which is 38,000 feet, um, which is uh, 11,000 foot deeper than Everest is high. Um, and um, and then, we've, then we're going to do a number of other dives, and um, we'll see how we go. Any questions? Any questions? Ma Mark? Um, um, th thanks, that's just fascinating because it takes us to a whole different level, <laughs> literally. Um, uh, th I mean, uh, Jose, you mentioned about your fuel. I'm not sure what your fuel is. I mean, obviously helium takes you up and parachutes take you down. Um, can you, Richard, can you con contrast that and tell us about the fuel that you're looking at for um, Virgin Galactic, because I'm certain yeah. you will have thought about all of the sustainability issues regarding that too. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, the exciting thing about Virgin Galactic is that our initial fuel will be, uh, per passenger, will be uh, 
less carbon output than a return ticket from um, New York, New York to London. So, I mean, you know, and that, and that compares with something like two weeks of uh, New York's electricity supply that it costs for a NASA to send, or it did cost for NASA to send a spaceship up there. So, uh, it, it's almost, almost insignificant. Um, you know, we, we think there is a possibility that we could get it down to completely carbon neutral, um, most likely not by the time we fly in a year's time, but soon thereafter. Um, uh, the uh, putting satellites into space, which is another arm of what we're doing, which, you know, to be perfectly frank, we, frank, we, you know, just by doing things, you sometimes stumble across other things, and, and you know, we suddenly realize, you know, hey, we've got this great mothership up there, you know, we, we, could, we could put satellites into space at a fraction of the price that they've been done in the past. So, um, so we're going to be able to put, um, you know, satellites into space for a tiny, tiny fraction of the carbon output that it currently takes to put satellites into space. And we're going to, you know, schools will be able to have their own satellites, universities will be able to afford to have their own satellites. You know, we're going to be able to monitor, you know, sea, le you know, sea levels, you know, carbon reefs, I mean, ev you know, everything. I mean, the, for the forests who's, you know, who's cheating and cutting down forests when they said they're not meant to be and so on at, 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 a, at a very, very low, low price. So, um, so I think um, it, it will be as carbon friendly as it can be really. And then you saw Yeah, so I wonder if you could just say something about how much helium you use in on every launch and how long is that sustainable for? Because my understanding is that helium is a limited resource. Um, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it, helium is a limited resource. It, it comes from, from the natural gas. It, it's as limited as natural gas is. And even though we will start with, with helium, uh, we're already looking at other mixes of lifting gases that are re renewable and, and, and not, not limited, like mix, mixtures of hydrogen and other, and other gases. I can't go into much detail on that, but we'll be negligible in any case. I mean, if we start to being a problem with the supply of helium, then it means that we are doing so well. I mean, <laughs> we're, it's, it's, not, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna happen that we get close. I mean, there's other industries that require helium, and. The, the party balloon industry, for instance, <laughs> and and we are really far away from that. But of course, uh, we uh, the, the company is called Zero to Infinity, and the zero stands for zero environmental impact, actually, and, and zero emissions. And, and and we think helium is the right way to start, but, um, but because we want to get away from as many risks as possible, we could start with hydrogen. I mean, people fly hydrogen balloons certified in Germany all the time. And it's been legal since the 18th century, and nobody's going to make it illegal now that we have better flam flammable resistant materials. But if we start with hydrogen, we run into the Hindenburg question and all that. So we'll start with helium and, and then move away from helium uh, as we uh, reduce the risk on other, on other aspects of the project. Sonny, do you have a question? Sorry. Um, yeah, I had um, two questions. What, one was um, on the definition of space, and it'd be interesting to have Jose and Richard's view on how high is, like, will Jose's balloon be c um, categorized as going into space? Um, and uh, so that's, that's, that's one. And, and the other is, um, Jose, wh 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 what do you see as the purpose of, of, of your innovation? I mean, Richard talked about his Virgin Galactic having sort of been the forerunner of the um, composite um, plane, you know, this, the Boeing 787 and so on in terms of uh, lighter materials for building planes and uh, big fuel savings as a result. Um, you also talked about satellites and so on. So, um, you know, there's clearly a purpose of, of doing it beyond just uh, lots of rich people going up in the air. Um, could, could you sort of talk a bit about what you see as the benefits of, you know, for mankind beyond just satisfying a few people? I, I know you talked about being up in space and having that perspective of the Earth and then coming back down again and being changed for life and, you know, taking on a new perspective on life. But beyond that, um, what, what do you see are the benefits for mankind, um, apart from those few lucky that will go up, the um, lucky few will go up? Um, well, the, 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 what was the first question, sorry? Uh, the, the definition of space. Yeah, the definition of space, that, that's right. Well, the, my, my, the, there's all sorts of different views, but I, I mean, I think 
we are in space right now. For the extraterrestrials, we are their extraterrestrial. Everything is space, and when you go up, that's something that you see clearly, that there's just a transition. There's really no, no physical boundary. And depending for what purpose, uh, that you draw a line. And to me, what really matters is a planetary awareness. And that's linked to your second question. I mean, to me, what the customer and most of the scientists are after is a vantage point where they can uh, see or measure that we are on a planet, that you clearly see the planet as an island in the middle of something very cold and vast and empty. And you see the atmosphere as a thin layer, and, and you feel like you have to protect it. And you can measure all sorts of things and do science with it. But that's what matters for me, not so much if it's what the, the US Air Force definition or the von Karman line. There's all these sort of, of definitions. I mean, to me, if, if it was, uh, you know, in, in it, some, a lot of people uh, use the 100 kilometer line. Okay, that there's a guy called von Karman that decided that. But I think that it's because we got 10 fingers. And 10 times 10 is 100. So in the world of, this, of the Simpsons, it would be 64 kilometers, you know, because they, they, they're four <laughs> finger <laughs> creatures. And, and in the world of, of uh, planet Dagobah, where Yoda, for all these uh, nerds like me, uh, and he has got three fingers, Master Yoda from Star Wars, and so it would be 36. Uh, we, we fly at 36. I mean, it's, to us, it, it doesn't really matter the number. It's, it's where the experience counts. And, and, and the, the benefit, I mean, if, if it's useful to have a scientist in a lab and not just it all robotic and have the last scientist at home, if it's useful to have a scientist in the space station uh, 400 kilometers above the Earth, I think it's useful to have a scientist in between. I mean, the human component is, is, is quite, quite useful. Uh, so having a scientist at 100 kilometers, having a scientist at 36 kilometers, I think it's great. And, and NASA is realizing that. And they're, they're asking different companies uh, like, like ours, what, what can we do there? Because it, I mean, it's, it's a space that has not been explored that much, this region above control air space. So yeah. yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, I don't think anybody should ever be embarrassed about doing something as an adventure First of all, um, that it's you know so pe people who set off to sort of um, find other lands or uh, you know to go to the moon. You know what was the purpose of going to the moon or uh, you know or or you know flying a flying a balloon to the you know edge of the Earth's atmosphere. I mean by by pushing the technology forward by you know shooting for, going for the stars, um, uh, benefits will come from it. Often benefits they don't even know exist at the time. I mean, I, I know for a fact that there will be scientists who will be hungry for the information uh, that, that from his balloon uh, to be able to test what's going on in the atmosphere at, that, at those levels without any pollution pollutant around, around this balloon. Uh, you know, being out there for three hours, I mean, that's going to be invaluable from, you know, for test, testing you know, the, damage, the damage we're doing to this Earth. So don't undersell yourself. I mean, you know, I think you'll find there'll be just a whole lot of things like that that you'll 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 you know almost stumble into and suddenly realize that um, my god this is you know you, you've actually created something which is really useful anyway. yeah there's another benefit another really reason why i started the company is um is to give our space engineers and material engineers and computer engineers a place where they can build really different things because aviation and my field has advanced in my opinion too slowly in the last 50 years or 60 years. And as a former Boeing employee, I, I love it there, I have great friends there. I think I have a, a little bit of a clue why. And, and having entrepreneurial companies like ours trying to do things that nobody has done for or ever, it's, it's, it's good to attract uh, people that are, have a I will be more motivated to do things like we do than to, to build Predator bombers or, or things like that, you know? And then, uh, another question, and then we have uh, Paul and uh, Mike, the last one. Yeah, I'm Miguel Ruano again. First, I want to say I share both your passion. Uh, my, you know, my father taught for an aeronautical engineer. When I was a kid, I used to be around airports and stuff, so uh, 
It's going to be good for many things, not for somebody who's going to be lucky to be up there. I have two questions. One very short one. Uh, one of you is talking in metric units, the other one is talking in imperial units. I think it would be good if you could make a translation for all of us who cannot pass the calculation. You're talking in feet, you're talking in kilometers. Now, uh, so we can compare where you are in terms of uh, height. Uh, okay. And there's, let me, yes, let me, let me, second question is for you specifically. Can you predict where you're going to land, uh, or it, does it go wherever the wind takes you? Okay, um, all system goes to 36 kilometers, which doesn't say much to almost anybody, but it's three times like an airliner, okay? Twice the altitude of Concorde, and three times less where Virgin Galactic will be flying, okay? So Virgin Galactic is here, 100 kilometers, and we're three times below, and an aircraft is three times below. And this International Space Station is four times higher than Virgin Galactic's vehicle. I don't know if that helps. And, and, and sorry, the, the, the other question. <laughs> the landing, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, we, that's something that has improved tremendously since the early days of high altitude ballooning in the 20s and 30s. There they didn't really no more have a clue. But now we, in our test flight, we've, we've landed where we expected. And the, the, the fact that the parachute is guided can correct you have a 40 kilometer downrange and cross range uh, air area so that, that you can correct uh, any error in predicting the trajectory. But our, our wind models have, have gotten good enough so that, that you can predict quite well uh, where you're going to land. And people will be waiting you there with a coconut or something. Um, so, yeah. Do you have a question there from Paul? Yeah, I just wanted to pick up a, a point that uh, Richard had made when you said that uh, Boeing and Airbus came to look at your mothership and then shortly after the... No, so, no it was, sorry, they, 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 what, they, what they are doing, I put it slightly wrong, they, they, they are, uh, they've been talking to us about doing all carbon composite uh, planes now, not just half, half and half, which yeah. is what the 787 is. No, and I, I thought that was really yeah. interesting. I mean, in the Maldives, you have a lot of people sort of snipe at the country saying, oh, how can you try and be environmentally conscious when everyone's coming here and flying long haul? So I just wondered uh, if I could ask the panel when you think the world's first carbon neutral airline will be able to operate? Um, uh, no, no, I'm not next week, sadly. But anyway, we, we, we um, I think it's get. I think it, it, it you know, this, as I said in the other, in, in the other, um, yesterday, or, you know, we're putting all all the profits we make, which actually isn't a very, isn't a lot these days, uh, from <laughs> our airline businesses um, into trying to develop clean fuels, and um, and I, you know, I do think there will be some breakthroughs, um, and um, and uh, and you know, so I think you know, watch this space over the next you know, in the next handful of years. I, I, I'm hopeful that uh, I, I'm hopeful that. Uh, the airlines that are investing in this in this area um, will um, will anyway will get the breakthroughs. I can't say more today. Yeah, uh, I'd like to add on that. That that's um, I mean we we're starting with a with a balloon because it's a system that has the least capital requirements to to get it certified and, and done. But I mean we would we would really love when we have uh, balloons in several bases around the world operating and. Uh, and what we, we're not going to tell the, the battery engineers or the material engineers, okay, now go home and, and take your stock options. And, and we, would, we would like to do other things. And um, I, I think that um, similarly as, as Tesla in the, in the automotive industry uh, is an outsider, but it's pushing uh, other industries. I think um, in aerospace, uh, it will not be the large OEMs that, that will find breakthroughs for, for several reasons. That's my opinion. I think there, it's more likely that entrepreneurial companies uh, that have learned the ropes through something innovative will, will the, be the ones that, that come up with, uh, with uh, more um, uh, carbon neutral solutions to aviation. Last question, Mike. Um, Thanks. Paul, uh, sorry, I want to just build on Paul's question. Um, here we have two incredibly innovative entrepreneurial people. <coughs> uh, let's just reflect on the airline industry and your comment, Jose, about how slowly it's moved. The Boeing 747 appeared on the drawing boards probably 1964, 1965, arrived in service 68. 
They're building hulls today with a 40-year life. We're talking about a 100-year product life cycle for this aeroplane. And of course, it's, an in, it's inherited from the 707, which was on the drawing board in the 19, early 1950s. That's an unbelievably long life cycle for a product that looks almost exactly the same. What do you think aviation is going to look like in 50 years? You know, just speculate a little bit. You're, you're, you're the innovators. You're the, you're the great visionaries. What do you think it's going to look like? Are we in balloons? Are we in li lift-based, you know, volumetric lift things? Are we going to get away from aeroplanes altogether? Where does it go? Any ideas? <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, uh, the, the engineers who are working on Virgin Galactic um, are itching to, to then move on to trying to see whether they, we can get uh, intercontinental flights just you know, pushing the plane out of the Earth's atmosphere and then popping it back down again, uh, going at um, tremendous speeds, uh, not damaging the Earth's atmosphere because they'll be out of the atmosphere. And, um, and, uh, and obviously that's only going to work if, 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 uh, if, it can be, if they can be eco eco economical. Um, and if you say 50 years from now, I mean, I'm hoping to see this in my lifetime because I love going London to Australia and the, 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 you know, visiting pla you know, places a long way away. And, and so, you know, once we've safely got Virgin Galactic ticked off, we will be turning the team on to looking at that. And, and they're likely to be, I mean, our, our spaceships all carbon fiber, our motherships all carbon fiber. It's very likely that these, that these, uh, these, the, these, uh, intercontinental planes will be all carbon fiber and they will they will effectively be spaceships um, and again it's you know through the innovation of you know just trying things that you you, you get the breakthroughs I mean but we tar you know re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere has, has traditionally been dangerous so um, NASA have lost uh, three percent of all their passengers which is not acceptable if you run a commercial spaceship company <laughs> um, and and you know so the uh, you know, our spaceship turns into a giant shuttlecock as it comes into the atmosphere, which slows it right up and, um, and, and avoids you having to suffer, you know, any, any, any considerable g-force and, and, it, and it's completely safe. I mean, the pilot can be asleep, you know, as you, as you re-enter. It doesn't have to go, go in any, any particular angle. So, breakthroughs like that will make it, it, it more likely that this will become a reality. Um, you know, there are people who say it's just never going to happen, but, you know, I, I, I mean, uh, you know, my great belief in life is just dream and then try to make a dream become reality. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the, it, it hasn't always been that way that the life cycle was so long. Like, if you look from the 20s to, the, to say, 1945, there were incredible numbers of designs and things that were tested and tried. And I mean, we have to realize that most of our technology, not just aerospace, is a byproduct of uh, defense ex research and, and, and war, like uh, in medical technology, in, 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 in telecommunications, in, in aerospace engineering. It's, it's, mostly, it's been mostly like that. And hopefully, now that we are a more aware species, we can move on with things that don't necessarily come from fear and, 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 and war. And and, and I think many of good ideas were casualty to this, to this um, criteria for what would get funded and what wouldn't get funded. And, and there's, for instance, there's a type of airship. I mean, airships we, we touched on the, the other day. And, and the pure airships is true <coughs> that they, they have lots of problems. But there's, there's a type of airship, it's called a hybrid airship, that mixes aerodynamic lift with, uh, with lifting gases. That, that actually the Soviet Union wanted to get into as a private company, but everything fell apart. But they, they had very interesting plans as a, one of the first private companies when they were trying to do something like China and, and, and failed. And, 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 and this sort of concept of, of, of airship could theoretically, I mean, it would be very slow, but if you're well connected on board and you have like a nice room and, and really nice in, in internet access and, and you can be productive on board and comfortable, and Maybe that, that has its market. I don't know. And, and so, it, as I said, it, 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 will, it will probably, it's hard to know, but it will probably be from, from people that, that don't feel limited by what they've seen and, and try new things like bird return or all this. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> yeah, <it's good. laughs>